In this quick take video, I'll be talking about what's changed for the 2021 Mazda CX-9 versus the 2020 and 2019 model year vehicles, how much this costs, how it compares to the direct competition, why you might want a CX-9 or why you might want one of the other alternatives. I'll also be asking the eternal question, why doesn't the CX-9 sell better than it does? Because in my mind, the CX-9 is quite simply the best looking crossover in this mid-size three row crossover segment. Admittedly, the CX-9 is not as roomy as some of the competition, but this is certainly as roomy on the inside as one of the best sellers in America, the Toyota Highlander. And I think that if you're shopping for a Highlander, you should definitely put the CX-9 on your shopping list. There are a lot of reasons that many more shoppers out there should be buying a CX-9, in my opinion, over that Toyota Highlander. The only real change on the outside of the CX-9 is a new grille for 2021. This is still the same size and shape as the grille on the 2020 CX-9 because none of the body panels on this crossover have changed. We still find attractive full LED headlamps up front and teeny tiny little LED fog lamps at the bottom of the bumper. When I've talked to people that were shopping for a mid-size crossover and they looked at a CX-9 and ended up buying something else, the most common reason I got from shoppers was they thought the CX-9 was too cramped on the inside, too small. Well, on the inside, this is about the same size as a Toyota Highlander. But a lot of this answer, I think, seems to do with perception because the CX-9 on the outside is definitely longer than the Highlander. A lot of that has to do with the way that Mazda chose to design the engine compartment right up front. You'll notice this has a longer hood proportion than we find in the Highlander. That's part of why this has a more elegant, more luxury car-like style. Very similar, interestingly enough, to something along the lines of a Volvo XC90, which has a four-cylinder engine in the same position as this Mazda CX-9, and also a long hood proportion. The downside is that the CX-9 is less space efficient. So as far as interior room to exterior dimensions, the CX-9 is going to be far less efficient than something like a Highlander, but on the inside, this does actually have about the same kind of legroom, headroom, and cargo room as the Highlander and the Honda Pilot. On the other hand, if you're looking for a bigger, roomier crossover, then you should be looking at something like a Traverse, a Palisade, or the Telluride, because they're going to be bigger on the inside and on the outside as well. One of the reasons you might want to get the CX-9 over some of the competition are the premium touches we find on the outside, like full LED tail lamp modules that are pretty rare in mainstream crossovers that this is competing with. The turn signal that you see over there on the other side and the backup lights are LED elements, and in most of the competition, only the brake lights and parking lights are LEDs. At the bottom of the bumper, we have dual exhaust tips. Be sure and let me know what you think about the design of the CX-9 down there in the comment section. And my only complaint back here is that we do get a fairly steeply raked rear glass right there that's gonna reduce cargo practicality behind the third row. When the CX-9 first launched, it was available with a wide range of driver assistance technologies, but it didn't have as many of those gadgets standard as we found in some Honda and Toyota models. But they changed that back in 2020, so we now have almost the entire suite of Mazda active safety technologies and driver assistance technologies standard in even the base trim of the CX-9. When this generation of the CX-9 first launched, Mazda raised more than a few eyebrows by making this available only with the 2.5 liter four-cylinder turbocharged engine, because most of the competition at that time had V6 engine standard. But things are a little bit different for 2021, where even the Ford Explorer now comes standard with a smaller turbocharged engine. It's a 2.3 rather than the 2.5 that we find under this hood. Depending on the gasoline you feed this engine, power output will range between 227 horsepower and 250 horsepower and up to 320 pound-feet of torque. This is a very torquey engine and that's why I'm really intrigued by the fact that Mazda's decided to send this engine to every vehicle in their lineup practically except for the Miata and the aging CX-3. So if you want this turbocharged engine in your Mazda 3 with all-wheel drive or you want it in a CX-30, you can do that. You can also get this in the Mazda 6 and Mazda CX-5. My one complaint about the CX-9 is the transmission. This engine is still mated to an in-house built six-speed automatic sending power either to the front wheels or to all four wheels. Fuel economy ranges between 23 and 24 miles per gallon and that would likely improve if they gave this a more modern automatic transmission. Not only would something like a more modern eight, nine, or 10-speed automatic likely be lighter than the six-speed, it would give you higher ratios for better fuel economy out on the highway. 23 to 24 miles per gallon is not too different from a number of the key competitors with more power power under the hood or V6 alternatives. And it would also likely give you better zero to 60 performance because a lot of those eight speed automatics have more aggressive starting gears. There of course have been tons of rumors about Mazda perhaps using a different transmission in the future, but at least for 2021, we still see the same six speed automatic. 
With a number of their recent products, Mazda is trying to target shoppers that are looking for, I guess you could say, value luxury or something a little bit more premium than the competition. And that's certainly true for the CX-9 signature here, where we find real wood trim in here, something that we don't find in most of the competition, real aluminum trim, and some more premium touches here and there. But unlike more luxury-oriented brands, or even some of those premium brands, we don't find as much seat adjustability. We find a two-way adjustable lumbar support, no extending thigh cushion. I do find this thigh cushion to be a little bit short, and we have a manual tilt tilt telescopic steering column rather than a powered tilt telescopic steering column like you would find in, for instance, a Lexus RX. Of course, the CX-9 is going to be significantly less expensive than a number of those luxury alternatives, but I do wish that the upper end trim would give us a little bit more seat adjustability for the driver. In keeping with the premium vibe, the CX-9 is available as a six-passenger crossover with a fixed console right here in the middle of the second row. We have a storage compartment that's about the same size as the one that we see up front, heated rear seats, and two large fixed cup holders. Although this is certainly in keeping with the premium image that Mazda wants to project with the upper end trims of the CX-9, the fact that there's no eight passenger version of this vehicle will make it a little bit tricky for families that are looking at something like a Pilot or a Highlander and looking at that emergency seat back there in the third row. All versions of the CX-9 have a two person third row, whereas the Highlander and the Pilot squeeze an itty bitty center seat back there. If you're debating between the second row captain's chairs and the second row bench seat, keep in mind that if you want to leave a child seat latched into place and tilt and slide the second row seats forward, you can do that with the bench seat, but you can't do that with these captain's chairs. Making things a bit more comfy back here, we have three zone automatic climate control with the controls right there in the center console between the front seats. Window shades integrated into the rear doors, but no panoramic moonroof, which is a little bit of a surprise. Here's a closer look at the fixed center console. We have the heated seat buttons, those two large cup holders, a little storage tray at the bottom of the console, and then these bifold doors that open up to give us access to that storage compartment and some USB charge only ports. In my mind, at least, the most direct competition for the CX-9 would be the Highlander and the Pilot, not really the larger three row crossovers like the Traverse, the Palisade, or Telluride. With that in mind, again, we find about the same kind of interior room in here that we do find in the Highlander and Pilot. The third row is relatively comfortable. My head does touch the ceiling if I try and put my head back there to the headrest, but it does in a Highlander and a Pilot as well. As I said before, the CX-9 is not as space efficient as the Highlander. So even though this is a lot larger on the outside, on the inside we find just about one inch more legroom. That's front row plus second row plus third row, the total combined legroom figure. There are some nice touches back here in the third row, however. We have USB charge ports for both sides. Large cup holders on each side with some additional storage cubbies, but as you'd expect in a lot of three row crossovers, all the plastics back here are hard, and the third row bench is not leather, it's actually imitation leather in this model, because logically, this third row is going to be spending most of its life folded. As with most three row crossovers, the third row folds completely flat with the cargo area in the rear, and because this is a 50-50 folding third row with only two seats, you can easily have one third row seat folded and still sit in the other. If you're looking for a crossover with a roomy cargo area behind the third row, you're probably not shopping for the CX-9 any more than you are a Highlander or a Pilot. But we do have a cargo area back here that can easily accommodate 22 inch roller bags in this position. One complaint back here, the lid does not go terribly high. And even at six feet tall, I do find myself bopping my head right here on the outer edges of this hatch. Some of the larger three row crossovers will certainly offer you more cargo space behind the third row, but if you really plan on carrying seven people and seven people's worth of luggage, you're probably gonna need a minivan or a full size SUV, or of course, a full size van. Mazda gives you a little bit of extra storage space under the cargo area load floor. This can be completely removed from the vehicle if you wanted to do that. And there's some little cutouts here so that way you could easily put the roller cargo cover back here if you wanted to. If we go further down the rabbit hole, we find the temporary spare tire and the subwoofer for the optional audio system. The interior design has not changed for 2021. We're driving the top end signature trim. So we have real wood trim over there on the doors right there by the window switches. We also have aluminum trim over here on the dashboard separating the hard plastics from the soft plastics. We do find hard plastics lower on the dashboard and then soft touch injection molded plastics above that. The tri-zone climate controls right here in the center console. And this center console has been a source of complaints for some folks that I've talked to that were shopping for a CX-9. They thought that the console was a little bit too big and too bulky and it limited some of the storage options. Indeed, we have a little bit less storage going on in here than we find in some of the competition, but the difference isn't huge. In this center console area here, we have a bifold opening similar to what we saw in that second row seat. A little bit of storage in there. That's also where we find the USB interface for the infotainment system. The infotainment screen in the dashboard is the primary change for 2021. Instead of a base seven inch screen and an optional nine inch screen, all versions of the CX-9 now get this widescreen, just over 10 inch screen. This is not a touchscreen unit, however. You do have to use the rotary controller in the center console, which is not my favorite input method. 
As you can see, it supports smartphone integration and the smartphone integration will use the entire screen. It's pretty easy to move back to the native Mazda interface. And here we notice that this is the same interface that we find in the new Mazda 3, of course the CX-30, and soon we'll be seeing this in the rest of the Mazda lineup. Versus the previous infotainment system, this system is significantly faster. So we don't have those awkward pauses or delays in launching Apple CarPlay or Android Auto as we found in the previous versions of the system. The design of the software is attractive, but this software is not quite as fully functional as we see in some of the competitive systems, so not quite as many options available here. We do have certain app integration here, so Pandora, for instance, built right there into the system, obviously Sirius XM as well, your typical Bluetooth phone interface, factory mapping interface, and then this is where we would adjust certain vehicle settings, including the heads-up display that's available. Aside from that, the only other main change in here is that we now get a wireless smartphone charging mat right there in front of the shifter. However, this vehicle does not support wireless CarPlay or Android Auto, so you're probably still going to have your smartphone plugged in. The controller for the infotainment system is still in the same place right here in the center console. We still have a power volume knob over there. And then if we move over to the driver's side, we have the same steering wheel and the same partial LCD instrument cluster. Right there in the middle, we have an LCD, but it's not quite as configurable as the full LCD displays that we do see in some of the competition. I decided to skip the drive section in this review of the CX-9 because nothing's really changed since 2020. Instead, let's just briefly go over the scores from that last time I drove the CX-9. 0 to 60 still happens in 7.2 seconds. 60 to 0 still happens in a relatively short 115 feet. That's because all CX-9 models come standard with some pretty wide tires as far as mainstream midsize crossovers go. If you want wider tires than come on the CX-9, you really will have to look at performance options like an SRT version of the Durango or the Ford Explorer ST or a luxury crossover like a BMW X5. The wide tires don't just help stopping distance, they also help the CX-9 be one of the best handling entries in this segment. Now clearly it's not going to have rear-wheel drive driving dynamics like a Ford Explorer, but it's still pretty fun to drive. Despite the older 6-speed automatic transmission, fuel economy is still pretty decent thanks to the 2.5 liter turbocharged engine, although it is worth noting there are going to be more efficient options in this segment, especially since we're going to be seeing more hybrids and soon plug-in hybrids as well. The Toyota Highlander Hybrid is incredibly efficient and you really don't give up too much performance versus the CX-9's turbocharged engine. Soon we'll also be seeing a new Kia Sorento with an available hybrid and plug-in hybrid system, so be sure and stay tuned for that if you're looking for something that's a little bit more fuel efficient. Now let's dive into the pricing. For 2021, the CX-9 starts at $33,960. That's about $850 less than a Toyota Highlander. The Highlander got notably more expensive in this generation. Base model to base model, the CX-9 is very well equipped. And I'm talking about the Highlander first here because the Highlander sells incredibly well. It's the best selling entry or the second best selling entry depending on the exact month that you're taking a look at in 2020. Any way you slice it, it outsells the CX-9 by about 9 to 1. And I think there are a number of reasons for that. Obviously, the Highlander has a strong reliability reputation. There are a few more Toyota dealers in the United States, so it's a little bit easier to get access to a Highlander, also to get it repaired. There's also the very attractive Highlander Hybrid, which is incredibly fuel efficient. In real-world driving, you will average between 35 and 36 miles per gallon, depending on the version that you get. And 0 to 60 time is not really going to be that far off the base engine in most of the competition. But on the other hand, the Highlander doesn't handle as well as the CX-9. It doesn't have that same engaging feel out on the road. I don't think it's as attractive as the CX-9 either. Be sure and let me know what you think about that down there in the comments section below. One thing's for certain, the Highlander, as I said before, is much more space efficient than the CX-9. That really is important to keep in mind. A lot of folks that I've talked to that have shopped for a CX-9 and opted to get something else went into the Mazda dealer thinking that the CX-9 would be bigger inside than it is, and in fact, it is about the same size as the Highlander and the Pilot inside. So if you're looking for something that's larger, you're going to want to look at something like the Kia Telluride, the Hyundai Palisade, perhaps something like the Volkswagen Atlas, or of course the Chevy Traverse. But if you're looking for something that's about the same size as the Highlander or Pilot inside, clearly those Pilot and Highlander shoppers should be in that category, then the CX-9 should really be just fine. It's about the same size inside. Some folks have complained that it doesn't have quite as many storage areas up front, and that definitely is the case with the CX-9. There are few fewer places to put things like large purses, etc. But I think for the average shopper, that's not going to be as big of a deal. The Toyota Highlander does have a newer 8-speed automatic transmission and a standard V6 engine, which is going to give it pretty decent standard performance. But there's not too much of a difference, really, between the turbocharged 6-speed that we find in the Mazda and the naturally aspirated V6 that we find in the Toyota Highlander. The big reason to get the CX-9 in my book is going to be standard equipment, value, and the fact that it's honestly more attractive inside and outside than the Highlander.
Next up, we have the Honda Pilot, which is about $1,700 less than a base CX-9, although we don't get the same kind of standard equipment that we find in the Mazda. Again, the Mazda sales proposition really is value, 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 and you'll find more deals on the hood of the CX-9 than the Pilot or the Highlander over there at the Toyota or Honda dealer. The main downside to the Pilot is the 9-speed automatic transmission that we still find in that model. Honda has not yet upgraded it into their new 10-speed automatic that we find in vehicles like the Odyssey and some of the other Acuras that are on sale in North America. Due to the general age of the Pilot, it also is feeling a little bit old inside, especially when it comes to the infotainment system, the general dashboard design, etc. It definitely has a slightly more rugged look to it than we find in the CX-9. I think the CX-9 is more elegant, more luxury oriented in terms of its design inside and outside. But I think that the CX-9, even though it came out around the same time as this generation of Pilot, feels a little bit more modern on the inside. You won't really find that much more room on the Pilot inside, but the third row is a little bit more comfortable. So if you are looking for something this size inside with a little bit more comfortable third row, you might want to get the Honda Pilot. The CX-9 is very engaging to drive, but the Pilot does have the availability of essentially Acura's super handling all-wheel drive system, although Honda calls it IVTM4 in the Pilot. It's basically the same system. Of course, if you were really interested in sportier driving dynamics, you might want to get the next option, which is the Ford Explorer. It's one of the few rear-wheel drive entries in this segment. Ford recently went back to rear-wheel drive after having been a front-wheel drive crossover for quite some time. That puts the Explorer and the Dodge Durango as the only two vehicles that are really going to drive differently in terms of driving dynamics versus all of the other three-row crossovers in America. Because of the Explorer's return to rear-wheel drive, it's not as space efficient as it once was, so it did get smaller inside, and even though it's larger than the CX-9, the difference is not huge. It still has a big cargo area in the back, but it doesn't have quite the same advantage that it had in the last generation, where it really had a cavernous minivan-style cargo area. Some folks have highlighted the standard turbocharged engine in the CX-9 as being one of the reasons, perhaps, that it doesn't sell as well as the competition, but the Ford Explorer comes standard with a smaller turbocharged engine, 2.3 liters rather than 2.5, and it's by far the best-selling engine in the Explorer. If you manage to get the elusive base trim of the Explorer, then theoretically it is about $1,600 less than the CX-9, and there do appear to be decent deals on the hood of the Explorer. However, most folks are going to be shopping for XLT or above, and those price points are going to be pretty similar even after discounts to the Mazda CX-9. When it comes to design, the Explorer is definitely modern and attractive, but I think the CX-9 manages to be a little bit prettier. One of the big selling propositions for the Explorer definitely is standard power. Thanks to the standard rear-wheel drive layout, standard 2.3 liter turbo, and 10-speed automatic transmission, 0-60 to is definitely very, very swift in the Explorer. This is one of the fastest vehicles in this segment, and I'm simply talking about the 2.3 liter engine. If you want to go faster than that, there are two different variants of a twin-turbo V6 that you can choose from. And that brings me back to the CX-9, and why doesn't it sell well? This is something that I've never been able to quite figure out. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comments section below. Now, do I think that the Mazda CX-9 should be selling as well as a Toyota Highlander? No, I wouldn't say that. You know, it's not going to be quite as reliable, statistically speaking. Uh, it doesn't have the same fuel economy that we find in the Highlander Hybrid. It's not going to be quite as roomy in the third row as some of the other alternatives in this segment. But it does everything pretty decently, and it's wrapped in a very attractive package. It's Decently fuel efficient, handles well, looks good, build quality is good, and Mazda has been relatively reliable in this segment as well. Even though the CX-9 is at the absolute bottom of the sales charts for 2020, reliability is up in the top five. Yes, you heard that right. For 2020, the CX-9 is the worst selling mid-size crossover in America. In 2019, in fact, there were months where the Ford Flex outsold the CX-9, and the Flex had been discontinued by that point. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that the CX-9 is my top pick in this segment. There are definitely some solid reasons to buy a lot of the alternatives. If you want to be able to tow, that's where the Dodge Durango comes in. If you want a lot of interior room, that's where the Hyundai and the Kia come in. If you have a lot of kids in child seats that can be latch anchored into the interior, there's the Volkswagen Atlas for you. If you want high fuel economy, there's the Toyota Highlander. But I don't quite understand why the CX-9 is the absolute worst selling in this segment, because when you take a look at the list of available options, I would probably buy the CX-9 over the Honda Pilot, and I would probably buy it over a base version of the Highlander as well. In all likelihood, I would probably also buy it over something like the GMC Acadia or the Nissan Pathfinder, and all of those options outsell the Mazda CX-9. The CX-9's low sales are honestly one of the things that perplex me most about the automotive market in America right now. Why does it sell so poorly? Be sure and sound off down there in the comment section below. Let me know your thoughts. And of course, if you are shopping for a three-row crossover in America, you should definitely put the Mazda on your shopping list. I think there are a lot of folks out there that would do well by buying a Mazda CX-9. 
They just don't seem to know that it exists, perhaps. Let me know about that. Find me over at facebook.com slash alexnados, over at Instagram, Twitter, all those other social places. And of course, check out the new AOA merch with new shirts right like this Trunk Comfort Index shirt. You'll find that over at aoamerch.com. You can also find a link over at alexandautos.com, but everybody should head over to aoamerch.com and find all their merch before the Christmas season. I'll see all of you later.